Well, we're back together again for another session. It's a, an immense pleasure to have this opportunity of sharing with you in thinking about God's mission in the world and the mission that's been committed to us. Uh, I hope you are taking the opportunity, if you are able to possess uh, Dr. Wright's book, to work through it. Uh, a couple of suggestions, I'll repeat them, but it may be worth keeping in mind that uh, with this book, that you may, you may like to consider using it as a basis for your own personal Bible reading uh, for a period of time, you know, to work through the material here in a way not just to um, stimulate your mind, but to use it as a basis for prayer and thought as a, a thing that's worth doing. Or if you've got the opportunity of being with other people to look through it as a group study, that's something you could do together and you could stimulate not only yourself, but others. And uh, you might like to use it if you have the opportunity of conducting, say, Bible study groups. You might like to use it as a basis for Bible study. Now, I'll let those uh, suggestions percolate and I'll, I'll repeat them again. But think of ways in which you can take this material uh, and incorporate it into your thinking, into your life and into your ministry, because it does cover uh, it does cover, as it says, a, a hermeneutic that helps you to expound and look at the whole Bible. Now, if you've had the opportunity of having extensive theological training, you'll, you'll have uh, hermeneutical structures to look through the Bible. If that's not been your privilege, then this is a valuable one uh, to help you understand and make use and properly expound the Bible when you have the responsibility of doing so. When I was a, a young man, not um, long out of theological training, uh, we had a, an eminent scholar visit us and uh, we were chatting with him and he, he passed us on a, a, a comment, a bit of wisdom that I, I share with you, I found it valuable. He said, gentlemen, uh, these three or four years that you've spent in study, you may never get the opportunity of that sort of extended time of concentrated study again. So let me suggest to you, he said, that to keep up your reading, if you've got access to books, he said, get a good book um, and put it on your desk or your table near you or wherever you, you sit and work at reading two or three pages a day. He said, in that way, uh, every year you'll read quite a lot of material. And I found that to be valuable, so I commend it to you. Also, uh, another beloved theological teacher used to say, for every one modern book you use, um, read a couple of old ones. What was he saying? Well, a lot of the wisdom, not all the wisdom is here in the present, a lot of it is in the past. And up until now, I've, it may be a doubtful thing now, I used to be able to say <laughs> that the greatest number of Christians who ever lived have lived in the past. Well, things are changing in the world and perhaps that's not quite as true, but let's remember what you don't want to disenfranchise those who've gone before us. So just a few thoughts and we'll repeat them and suggest, make some other suggestions to you as we go on. But let's get on with our topic today, which is in the closing sections of uh, Dr. Wright's book. And those last four sections are dealing with the arena of mission. And we've already looked at the question of mission and God's earth and commission and God's image. And I hope you've been able to work through those and perhaps deal with the questions. Uh, as we turn today now to think about God and the nations in Old Testament vision, it's a reminder, uh, as you see on the slide, that the nations, the nations of the world, are the matrix of Israel's life. That is, Israel operates in the Old Testament within the context of wider nations. Let me uh, read to you the, um, the introduction from, uh, to this chapter from Dr. Wright. The nations, he said, of humanity preoccupy the biblical narrative from beginning to end. When they are not in the foreground, they're in the background. When they are not the subject of great international events, they are the object of divine inspection or accusation. When they are not the direct focus of God's attention, they remain the surrounding context for good or ill of the life of God's people. 
The obvious reason for this is that the Bible is, of course, preoccupied with the relationship between God and humanity. We've already thought about this, haven't we? And humanity exists in nations. Where the Bible focuses especially on the people of God, that people necessarily lives in history and in the midst of the nations. So he says it is clear that Israel as the light to the nations is no peripheral theme within the canonical process. The nations are the matrix of Israel's life and the raison d'etre for her very existence. So the story, and we're thinking now particularly about the Old Testament, in our next session we'll think about the New Testament. We think about the Old Testament and how Israel exists within the nations and her life is conditioned first by the calling of God that she should be the light to the nations, but also conditioned by the impact that the nations have upon her. And as we know in the story, some of that impact is disastrous. And they, uh, Israel is conditioned often much more by what she sees around her than by her calling to be priests to God, to worship and honour God alone and to make him known to the nations round about as they observe the life of the people of God. Um, I'm going to ask you as we work through this just now to take your Bible again and to look at what is now a familiar passage, the last two chapters of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1 and chapter 2. Remember chapter 1 begins by saying that uh, John saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And he saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. He said, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is with men, it's men and women of every nation. He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. He goes on to say that, uh, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the fountain of the water of life without payment. He who conquers shall have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. And it says, for the cowardly, the, f the faithless, the polluted, for the murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, liars, they shall have their lot in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. But as he goes on through that um, that passage. He talks about the city with the gates, with the names of the, um, the sons of uh, uh, two angels, with the names of, on their uh, the gates. Let me read that to you. Um, the names of the 12 tribes, the sons of Israel inscribed on it. Um, just come down the page and verse 22, he said, I saw no temple there for the temple is the Lord the Almighty and the Lamb, and the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and the lamp, uh, the lamp is the Lamb. By its light, and here it is, shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, and its gates shall never be shut by day. So here the focus is the nations. Yes, the, the people of God now are drawn from not just ancient Israel, but from all the nations. And if we look into chapter 22, it says, Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, through the middle of the streets of the city also, on the other side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And here it is. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Yes, shall no more be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall worship him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. 
The night shall be no more. They need no light of the lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they shall reign for ever and ever. So, here are the nations healed and drawn into the fellowship of God. You may remember that we talked about the triangle that Dr. Wright gave, the smaller triangle of uh, God, Israel, and the land inside the bigger triangle of God now and the nations and um, the whole world as the gambit of mission. Now, Dr. Wright goes on, he says that the nations first appear in the biblical grand narrative in the context of life after the flood, God's catastrophic judgment on human wickedness. By Genesis 11, the nations have been scattered in confusion. The conflict of nations mirrors the brokenness of humanity as a whole. It's a good picture of it. With undoubtedly deliberate intent, the final book of the Bible comes to its climax with the picture of the nations purged of all sin, walking in the light of God, bringing their wealth and splendor into the city of God, contributing their redeemed glory and honor to the glory and honor of the Lamb of God. And we read that in um, chapter 21, verses 24 to 27. The brokenness of humanity is healed at the river of the, and the tree of life in 22, 1 to 2, as we've already read. And between these two great scenes in Genesis and Revelation, that is the, um, the fall of man and the confusion of the nations uh, and the spread of the nations in Genesis 11, to Revelation here, to the healing of him, he said, the primal and ultimate state of the nations, the Bible records the story of how such cosmic transformation will have been accomplished. It is, in short, the mission of God, as we've been seeking to elucidate in the preceding chapters. God's mission is what fills the gap between the scattering of the nations in Genesis 11 and the healing of the nations in Revelation 22. It is God's mission in relation to the nations, arguably more than any other single theme, that provides the key that unlocks the biblical grand narrative. That's why I've said this, what, this, this book and the themes and the way it develops it provides you with an appropriate way of reading the Bible story as a whole, right throughout. And I commend it to you for that reason and to your study for that reason. Um, he says, um, in, these, uh, in this book, we will survey the great sweep of biblical teaching and expectation since it lies at the heart of a fully biblical understanding of mission. And that's what we've been thinking about. We've talked about the fact that we could just pin before us the, the, the command, Christ's, Christ's command to go and make disciples of all nations. That is, that's a, a, a banner head, but it falls within the wider context of mission. And if we only choose that, we will miss much of what God has wanted to say to us about his mission, about our mission as human beings and our mission as the church. He says, then we will observe that the experience of Israel's faith and worship, if not always the outcome of their practice, was that the nations should come to benefit from the history of salvation and give thanks for it. This means that the nations would eventually acknowledge and worship Israel's God, Yahweh with all the concomitant responsibilities and blessings. So, he says, More remarkably yet, there are voices and visions within the Old Testament that looked for a day when nations would be included within Israel in such a way that the very word Israel would be radically extended and redefined. We've thought about that. All this constituted the horizon of mission to the nations in the New Testament and provided the strong scriptural justification for such mission for those who engaged in it. So there we are. We see Genesis 11, the nations divided, and the history of the nations and Israel within that life, often uh, badly influenced by it. We come to the end and we see what God is purposing, that all humanity in its life as nations will ultimately participate those redeemed out of every tribe and every tongue and every nation participating in the new heaven and new earth 
So when we turn to think now about the, the nations, um, we move on to think of the nations in creation and providence and the nations as part of created and redeemed humanity. Um, this is how he takes this heading. He says, um, although we first meet the nations in the context of the fallenness and arrogance of humanity, even after the flood, the Bible does not employ, Im, imply, I'm sorry, that ethnic and national diversity is in itself sinful or the product of the fall. Even if the deleterious effects of strife among nations certainly are, rather nations are simply there. Uh, they are a given part of the human race as God created it to be. God rules over the nations, amply affirmed throughout the Old Testament is simply a function of the fact that he created them in the first place. Speaking as a Jew to Gentiles in an evangelistic context, Paul takes for granted the diversity of nations within the unity of humanity and attributes it to the Creator, uh, to his world-governing providence. Uh, and quoting from Acts chapter 17, verse 26, he goes on to say that from one man, he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. Um, he says, although Paul goes on to quote from Greek writers and uh, as you read Acts 17.26, you remember that he makes reference to certain of their poets he says his language in the verse is drawn from the Old Testament, from the ancient song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32 at verse 8. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples. So national distinctives then are part of the kaleidoscopic diversity of creation at the human level, analogous to the wonderful prodigality of biodiversity at every other level of God's creation. So as God's co-creation is, uh, is a blessed uh, and uh, glorious um, proliferation of, uh, of God's grace, um, so the, um, the diversity of human beings. So we're thinking now of the nations as part of a created and redeemed humanity. And we've read from Acts 17:26, with its background in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. And if you have the book, you can see that there. If you don't, then please look up those passages and uh, let them dwell in your mind. He goes on to say, furthermore, the eschatological vision, that is, of redeemed humanity at the end in the new creation, points to the same truth. The inhabitants of the new creation are not portrayed as an homogenous mass or as a single global culture. Rather, they will display the continuingly glorious diversity of the human race through history. So it's a marvellous uh, thing, isn't it? That uh, hmm, what we say, even in the new heaven and the new earth, there may be that glorious diversity which actually brings praise uh, to God for that diversity and the particularities that each nation and race of people brings to it. People, he says, of every tribe and language and people and nation will bring their wealth and their praises into the city of God. And uh, that is in Revelation uh, 7, 9 and 21, 24 to 6 to 26. We've read that. He said, the image we might prefer from the Bible's portrait of the nations is not a melting pot in which all differences are blended, but a salad bowl, there we go, in which all the ingredients preserve their distinctive colour. The new creation will preserve the rich diversity of the original creation. A wonderful thing to consider and to look forward to. Just contemplate what it will be like. Presumably we don't have the difficulties of coping with language differences there. We'll all speak the language of heaven. People argue whether it's Hebrew or Aramaic or whatever it might be. But there will be a commonality uh, 
but there will be that diversity. And that's, that's a lovely thing to think about. So all nations are part of creation and part of the redeemed humanity. Nations, national lives are significant. All right, he goes on then to think about all nations, not only being part of God's created pattern, but all nations standing under the judgment of God. Um, he says from the Exodus, well, let me read some of his words. For those of us who have ascribed a predominantly individualistic way of thinking about life, that is, particularly those of us in the, in the Western world, think of us very much as individuals. We uh, are individualistic. We think of ourselves um, as almost isolated units. There are others there and we relate to them in various ways. But there's not a sense of human solidarity as there is in other cultures. So he said, for those of us who have ab absorbed a predominantly individualistic way of thinking about life, faith and our relationship with God, one of the more difficult biblical concepts to get our minds around is the idea that God can and does deal with nations as a whole. Now, you may be from a culture where that is a natural way to think, but for people, particularly in the Western world, it's not necessarily one that we come to easily and we have to grapple with it. Yet he says the Bible unquestionably affirms it, and not only affirms it, but illustrates it in graphic detail over the long stretch of history. From the book of Exodus onwards, nations play their part in the biblical narrative, and the opening story becomes somewhat paradigmatic. The battle between Yahweh, God, and Pharaoh, as we read about in the Exodus, and we've touched on that, it's not just between God and one recalcitrant individual, Pharaoh. It's the whole nation of Egypt is implicated in the sin of oppression and suffers in the process of God's liberating justice. So when it's speaking about Pharaoh, it's speaking of him as heading a nation. And that is a, is a challenge for us as individualists to think of it, but there it is. So the narrative goes on to show how successive nations either set themselves against Yahweh and his people out of their own malicious initiative such as the Amalekites, the Moabites and the Amorites, or have become so incorrigibly wicked that they are to be destroyed in the execution of God's punishment, like the Canaanite nations. Remember when we think about Abraham, their um, iniquity has not yet been filled up, but later when God sent his people into the land, it was a judgment on them. Thus, while Israel is warned against arrogantly imagining that their victory over the Canaanites will be on an account of their own righteousness, God confirms that it will be on account of the wickedness of those nations. And um, if you take a moment to look at Deuteronomy chapter 9, you'll read those. Deuteronomy chapter 9. Uh, here we go, Deuteronomy chapter 9, and looking at verses 4 to 6, where it says, Do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, it is because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land, whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart are you going in to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may confirm the word which the Lord swore to your forefathers, or to your fathers, Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So it, it, was, it was judgment in one case, the gift of the land. It was grace on the other hand. Um, yeah, so... All right, he goes on, the image we might prefer from the Bible's portrait of the nations is not a melting pot, as we've said, it is more a salad bowl. Uh, we're thinking now of the nations standing under the judgment of God. God intended to use Israel as the agent of his historical judgment on the wickedness of Canaanite nations. He says... Um, he quotes a, a scholar by the name of Walter Brueggemann. He says, um, 
he thinks that his treatment of this is uh, not as encouraging as he thinks it ought to be. He speaks of Israel's preferential or exceedingly harsh presentation of the nations in the interests of Israel, which is, he says, ideological because of the sovereignty of Yahweh is drawn most blatantly and directly into the service of Israel's political agenda. The destruction, the destruction of the nations negatively serves to establish the legitimacy of Israel's claim. But I, Dr. Wright wants us to consider that um, Deuteronomy 9 that we've read makes it precisely the opposite case. Israel has no legitimate claim to the land at all. She has no greater righteousness than the nations. Indeed, the chapter stresses and if anybody deserves to be destroyed, it was Israel. Israel still existed only by God's forgiving grace. So there is grace and judgment. He said the prophets in their oracles against the nations, though they do not remark, though they do have remarkable words of hope and potential restoration, express the overwhelming conviction that the nations in general stand under the imminent judgment of God for a variety of reasons, which are mainly ethical because of their behaviour. He said, Isaiah portrays the grim reality in the searing words near the beginning of his so-called little apocalypse. Oh, the idea, apocalypse. And his, he quotes that in Isaiah 24. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Isaiah chapter 24. I'm stumbling here over my words. Pardon me. You can read it in the book where it's no stumbling. Isaiah 24, verses 5 and 6. Well, third. So the earth mourns and withers. The world languishes and withers. The heavens languish together with the earth. The earth lies polluted under its inhabitants. For they have transgressed the laws, violated the statutes, broken the everlasting covenant. There is a curse. Therefore a curse devours the earth and its inhabitants suffer for their guilt. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are scorched and few men are left. It's a word of searing judgment, as uh, Dr. Wright says, that um, universal wickedness is spoken of. He goes on to say, universal wickedness faces universal divine judgment. It is abundantly clear throughout the Bible that this is the default position that the human race is in for nations as much as for individuals. The nations are under the judgment of God uh, for very real reasons for their moral and spiritual failure. It is, um, it, it is tragic and it's a record of history that uh, nations rise and fall. Our, my country of Australia was part of the great British Empire when I was a boy. Um, you could look at um, a map of the world, but uh, it was across the world. It, it had its strengths, it had its weaknesses, and it has, um, it has collapsed to something much less. It, uh, it has its own weaknesses and sins, as do the other nations. And he says, against such a bleak background, God's mission to bless the nations and the mission of God's people as the vehicle of such blessing constitute very good news indeed. National life carries within it, in a sense, the seeds of its own decline and, and disaffection. And that has been true of nations everywhere uh, in history. So they lie under the judgment of God here, and that's what we're thinking about. Also, the remarkable fact that it is true that any nation can be used by God as an agent for his judgment. Um, he goes on to say, In the case of Sodom and Gomorrah, God delivered his judgment unmediated. It was uh, something that you know, he did directly. That is why the narrative acquires such proverbial force as a symbol of the naked wrath of God, which reaches a biblical climax, of course, in the book of Revelation, in the judgments that we read about there. However, in the more normal course of history, God uses one nation or another as the instrument of his sovereign justice. The classic first interest of this in the Bible is the way the conquest of the Canaanites by the tribe of Israel 
is repeatedly interpreted as the outworking of Yahweh's judgment on a society where iniquity was full. And uh, that's expressed in uh, Genesis 15, 16. So let's turn to that so that you have it in your mind. Genesis 15. Here we go. Verses Genesis 15. You remember this is um, the passage in which we looked before some time ago at uh, God's promises to Abraham. And in verse 16 it says... Um, Verse 15, we'll start, As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Israel was to be a judgment. The Israelites were severely warned not to interpret their victory over the nations of Canaan as attributable in any way to their own righteousness, they could certainly infer correctly that it was on account of the nation's wickedness, as we've looked at before. In this instant, God was using the Israelites as the agent of his judgment on the Canaanites. And that's Deuteronomy 9, verses 4 to 6. He goes on to say, The lesson Israel had to learn from this signal part of their own history, however, was far from comforting. The fact was that if God could use Israel... As the agent of his judgment on wicked nations, he could readily apply the same principle in reverse. And uh, he says, warnings to this effect abound in the Torah. And he gives a list of them. Let's, let's look at it. Let's turn to Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18. And uh, verse 24 to 28, he says, Do not defile yourselves to Israel. By any of the things, of these things that he's listed before. For by all these the nations I am casting out before you defile themselves, and the land became defiled, so that I punished this, its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my ordinance, and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who sojourns among you. For all these abominations the men of the land did, who were before you, so that the land became defiled, lest the land should vomit you out when you defiled it, as it vomited out the nations that were before you. For whoever shall do any of these abominations, the persons that do them shall be cut off from among their people. So keep my charge, never to practice any of those abominable customs, which were practiced before, and never to defile yourselves. Why? Because the land will vomit you out and that God will ultimately bring other nations to bring judgment upon you as he actually did. Have a look while we're in Leviticus at 26. Leviticus 26 and verse 17, which says... Um, starting at 16, uh, 14. But if you will not hearken to me and will not do these commandments, if you spurn my statutes and if your soul abhors my ordinances so that you will not do my commandments but break them, I will do this to you. I will appoint over you sudden terror, consumption and fever that waste the eyes and cause life to fall away. And you shall sow your seed in vain and your enemy shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be smitten before your enemies. Those who hate you shall rule over you, and you shall flee when none pursues you. The threat that God will bring nations to judgment on Israel. Um, as he comes down, he says, In the long history of Israel in the Old Testament period, it is the latter the direction of God's judgment that predominates. Judge, ju Judges chapter 2 describes the pattern set in the early generations after the settlement of the tribes in the land of Canaan. Do you remember how it goes? Let's just quickly turn to uh, Judges. Joshua and Judges. Judges, we're getting there. Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. Um, 
sets the parable that after the burial of Joshua, in verse 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals, or the Baals. And they forsook the Lord their God, their fathers who brought them out of Egypt. Then verse 13, the, they forsook the Lord and they served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. 14, so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he gave them over to plunderers who plundered them. And he sold them into the power of their enemies round them so they could no longer withstand their enemies. Wherever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them um, and they were in sore straits. It was tough going. So he's, he's making the point and reminding us that God can use any nation to be the agent of his judgment and he actually did um, in the history of Israel, the nations round about. He says, um, time and again, Yahweh brought other nations as the tools of his anger against Israel's rebellion and apostasy. And he encourages us to look at Amos 6 and Hosea 10 and Isaiah 7, 18 and 9, 11. Uh, in the latter centuries of the monarchy, even the great empires of the world were seen by the prophets as no more than a stick in the hand of Yahweh, a rod to punish Israel. And it's worth turning to Isaiah chapter 10. So let's turn there to see that. It's, um, it's a powerful statement. And God ra raises up not only... Um, The Babylonians here, but then the Persians ultimately on the Babylonians. But uh, Isaiah 10, let's look at that. Look at 5 and 6. Um, he's talking here of Assyria. Um, ah, Assyria, the great nation of Assyria, which came down and uh, decimated the northern kingdom as Israel. Ah, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff of my fury. Against a godless nation I send him, and against the people of my wrath I command him to take spoil and seize plunder, and to tread down like mire of the streets. He says, but he does not he so intend, and his mind does not think, but it in his mind to destroy and to cut off nations not a few. But he is seen then as the instrument of God's judgment on his people. So... It's a remarkable thought, and undoubtedly, uh, though we don't necessarily have the prophetic minds to interpret it for us, God uses nations uh, today, I guess, in that same way. He certainly operates in the, in the role of the nations. So, he goes on. Uh, after that, then the Babylonian becomes God's agent of judgment, not only on Israel, but on other smaller nation states, who are urged by Jeremiah to recognise the sovereignty of Yahweh, the God of Israel, and submit to his servant um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 25 and read those words as a reminder of how um, God uses the nations as instruments of his judgment. 25 verse 9, he says, verse 8, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, says the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the nations round about. I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror, a hissing and an everlasting reproach. So here is God not only using Assyria, using Babylon, and as he goes on, um, indeed, the principle that God can use the nations as his instrument, agents of judgment on other nations applies not only to his dealings with Israel, God's judgment on Egypt also will be carried out through Nebuchadnezzar, according to Ezekiel. You may like to have a look at that. Ezekiel 30, verse 10 to 11. Stay down, that word, Ezekiel. 30, verse 10 and 11. Ezekiel 30, verse 10 and 11. 
Here's the prophecy. Thus says the Lord God, I will put an end to the wealth of Egypt by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the most terrible of the nations, shall be brought in to destroy the land and they shall draw their swords against Egypt and fill the land with the slain. So he uses nations against nations. And he says later, of course, Babylon itself falls under the prophetic word of judgment. Even though God had used it to punish Israel, its excesses put Babylon in turn into the blast path of God's wrath, which will be delivered at this time through Cyrus of the Medes and Persians. And uh, have a look at Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47. Do look up all these verses and reflect on them and let them fill your mind again with uh, how the sovereign hand of God um, fulfills his purposes in a multitude of ways. Chapter 47, verse 6 and uh, 7, he says, um, Sit in silence and go into darkness, O daughter of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, for you shall no more be called the mistress of kingdoms. I was angry with my people. I profaned my heritage. I gave them into your hand. You showed them no mercy. On the aged, you made your yoke exceedingly heavy. You said, I shall be mistress forever, so that you did not lay these things to heart or remember them. Because of that failure, he will bring, uh, bring them down. The beginning of that chapter, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit on the ground without a throne, because God will bring his instrument, you know, Cyrus, the king of the Persians, upon them to bring judgment. So he says in this concluding this, so the overwhelming message is consistent. All the nations are in the hands of Yahweh, the living God. Their victories too are not to be attributed to their own gods, but rather to the sovereignty of Yahweh. And sometimes God may use a nation, any nation, as the agent of historical justice in the arena of international affairs. That, in itself, does not make the nation so used any more righteous than another, as Israel was categorically told. All it means is that God remains sovereign. And you and I, whatever we nation we may belong to, and um, whatever um, happens within it, uh, ultimately, we look to the sovereign hand of God. Uh, that doesn't mean that we should not, where we are, do all that we can to maintain our nation uh, and in righteousness and truth and in good behaviour. But whatever ultimately befalls uh, the situation in which we live, we belong to another kingdom and we look to God and see his hand working in the affairs of the world. We may not always be able to understand why it's happening and how it's happening, but we trust God. So he then says, any nation can be the recipient of God's mercy, not only uh, judgment, but uh, also any nation can receive mercy at the hands of God. Um, Exodus, have a look at it. Well, let me read a little bit of it. He said, the same universality by which all nations stand under the judgment of God for their wickedness and idolatry, is also used or deployed in the Old Testament thinking about the mercy of God. Um, he talks about um, Exodus 33 and Exodus 34. Th they're worth turning to and looking at. So let's go back to Exodus. <clears throat> Exodus 33, first of all. Yeah, Exodus 33, now we're there, we're nearly there. Exodus 33, coming up, coming up, coming up, there it is. Exodus 33, and looking at verse 19, it says, it's God speaking, let's start at 17. The Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have found favour in my sight. I'm sorry. And the Lord said to Moses, Moses had made a request for God's promise. He said, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. For you have found favour in my sight, 
and you will know my name. Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name. The Lord, Yahweh, and I will be gracious to you. Remember we thought about Exodus 3 in this. I will be gracious. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face. The man of God shall not, um, a man cannot see me and live. The Lord said, behold, there's a place here and you can see my hinder parts as he passes by in a form that uh, in somehow Moses could see. But this statement about God, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, um, is repeated in chapter 34 at verses 6 and 7. Uh, when uh, Moses was told to cut two tables for the uh, statement of the, um, the commandments. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and mercy, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, the children's children, to the third and fourth generation. God is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and mercy. And as we read from 33, that can be shown to whomsoever God will. And we, we know that God wills to show it to the nations. Jeremiah 18 is a well-known passage. Let me ask you to turn to that. Um, Jeremiah 18, the story of the potter. You got it there? Okay. When uh, he goes down to the potter's house and uh, as um, uh, Wright goes on to say, the clearest articulation of this impartiality in God's dealings with the nations is given by Jeremiah after visiting a potter at work. The lesson that Jeremiah draws from his observation of a potter who declared an initial intention but then changed his plans and therefore the end result became some response in the clay is that God likewise responds to human response to his declared intentions. The focal point of the potter metaphor in Jeremiah 18 is not so much on the unquestionable sovereignty of the divine potter, but on the potential that resides in the clay to cause the potter to change its intention. So as you look at Jeremiah 18, and uh, the Lord came to me and said he went down to the potter's house and he saw the piece of pottery is making spoiled in the potter's hands and he reworked it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter. So the Lord says in, chapter, in verse 5, the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, says the Lord? Behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hands, O, o house of Israel. If at any time I declare concerning a nation, there it is, or a kingdom, that I will pluck up and break down and destroy. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will repent of the evil and that I intended to do to it. And if at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I shall build and plant it, if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will repent of the good which I have intended to do to it. Now therefore say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Thus saith the Lord, I am shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Return every one of you from his evil ways and amend your ways and your doings. This was a word directed to Israel, but as you read it, you see that it, 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 God's uh, dealings in this way extends to the nations beyond Israel. He goes on then to talk about the book of Jonah, and uh, that is uh, worth a consideration. He says, the book of Jonah could have been written as a case study of this passage in Jeremiah 18. Jonah proclaims the impending doom of Nineveh uh, from king to beggar. The city repents. That's the story of Jonah, Jonah, as you may recall. 
uh, and he goes on to say, So God also repents and withholds his judgment. But the amazing twist of the book is that this signal generation, uh, d- demonstration, I'm sorry, of the mercy of Jehovah, of Yahweh, as God in dealing with foreign nations is an embarrassment to Jonah. Jonah knew the excellent account of Yahweh perfectly well and quotes the pre the uh, key proof text in uh, Jonah 4, 1 and 2. Let's just look at that. Turn to Jonah. Jonah, here we are. Jonah chapter chapter 4. Um, Let's have it. In Jonah 4, verse 1, he says, um, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord, I pray thee, Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to, Tar- to, flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and you repent of the evil. Here's the word from that that we read from that Exodus account. Jonah knows it, and he um, he knows that it indicates that God will show mercy to any who actually turn to Him, and he doesn't necessarily particularly want this to happen, but it does. Um, but what should have been, he says, a matter of praise in the repentance of uh, this city or even merely grudging admiration that Yahweh should turn out to treat other nations with the same amazing mercy that he lavished on Israel, he becomes a matter of bitter complaint in the mouth of Jonah. And uh, this book of Jonah is really, in a sense, a missionary handbook of God's concern for other nations and for their well-being. But uh, sadly, the prophet Jonah has is not of a mind that shares God's mind at that point. And it's important that we should, we should pray that we will have the mind of God as we set about the mission that God has given to us. He goes on, The book of Jonah has always featured in biblical studies of mission, sometimes as almost the only part of the Old Testament deemed to be of any relevance. Here at least is someone who had some semblance of being an actual missionary sent to another country to preach the word of God. However, for all the fascination of the character and adventures of Jonah, the real missional challenge of the book undoubtedly and intentionally lies in its portrayal of God. If Jonah intended to represent Israel, as seems likely, then the book issues a strong challenge to Israel regarding their attitude to the nations, even enemy nations, that prophets placed under God's declared judgment and regarding their understanding of God's attitude to the nations and concluding open-ended question of the book as an enduring, haunting rebuke to our tendency to foist our own ethnocentric prejudices on the Almighty. God says, should he not have mercy on that great nation that... um, He said, should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? God would have an intention to, um, to bless and to save. He said, it's interesting to uh, compare the con- and contrast the response of Jonah um, to the word of the divine judgment on a pagan nation of that of Abraham. Commissioned to proclaim Nineveh's scorn, Jonah ran away and jumped in a boat. Um, But informed by God's intention to investigate the outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham jumps to intercession and finds Yahweh prepared to be even more merciful than he initially bargained for. Quite a contrast. Um... He quotes Nathan MacDonald, he says, who finds a thread running through the text, such as Genesis 18, 
Exodus 32 to 34 and Psalms 103 to and uh, Ezekiel 18. That is, as it occurs in Genesis 18, that the judge of all the earth who will unquestionably do what is right, and he does do what is right by all nations, is also the gracious and compassionate God who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they should turn from their ways and live. The character of the Lord is exercised in forgiveness and mercy extended to all nations, not just to Israel. So we're considering the role of the nations and it is that they can too can be the recipients of God's mercy as God looks at the nations, the ones that he's created. Jeremiah 12 um, is a passage that um, I ask you to return to and consider. And he concludes this, um, this section by saying, this surely has to be one of the most foundational elements of the, old uh, of the Old Testament's contribution to our theology of mission. Let's have a look at it in Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah chapter 12. Chapter 12, verses 14 to 17, where he says, Thus says the Lord concerning all my evil neighbours who touch the heritage that I have given to my people, Israel to inherit, behold, I will pluck them up from their land and I will pluck up the house of Judah from among them. And after I have plucked them up, I will again have compassion on them and I will bring them again each to his heritage and each to his land. It shall come to pass if they will diligently learn the ways of my people to swear by my name as the Lord lives, even as they taught my people to swear by Baal, then they shall be built up in the midst of my people. But if any nation will not listen, then I will utterly pluck it up and destroy it, says the Lord. So, writes Dr. Wright, this surely has to be one of the most foundational elements of the Old Testament contribution to our theology of mission. First, if it were not the case that all nations stand under the impending judgment of God, there would be no need to proclaim the gospel. But, if it were not for the fact that God deals in mercy and forgiveness with all who repent, there would be no gospel to proclaim. Okay, so all nations may be recipient of God's mercy and we recognise that as we heed the words of the Master to go and make disciples of all nations. All nations' histories are under God's control. It's worth considering. He says... Wright says, in previous chapters, I've stressed the uniqueness of Israel's relationship with Yahweh. Their understanding of election, redemption, covenant and holiness set them apart from the nations at a fundamental level. God has chosen and called Israel as no other nation has done. And he directs us to Deuteronomy 7 and Amos 3.2, in which you, I ask you to look at. But God has redeemed Israel in a way that he has done to no other nation. God has revealed his law to and entered into a covenant relationship with Israel. As Psalm 147 says, And this nation was called to embody and demonstrate all this uniqueness in practical, ethically, ethical distinctiveness from all the other nations. Look at Leviticus. It's, it's mentioned there, but let's look at that. Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18, in the first five verses, The Lord said to Moses, Say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord your God. You shall not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where you dwelt. You shall not do as they do in the land of Canaan, to which I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes. You shall do my ordinances and keep my statutes and walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my ordinances by doing which a man shall live. I am the Lord. So there was to be a distinctiveness. In these respects, the relationship between God and historical Israel in the Old Testament period was unprecedented. He had not done anything like this before, and unparalleled. He had not done he had done nothing like this anywhere else, not before or anywhere else. <clears throat> 
Furthermore, says Dr. Wright, we've explored the missiological implications of these great unique claims. All of them flow from God's own mission in the world, from creation to new creation, Israel's identity and their role within that mission to be a people that displayed the character of God in their life and were a light to the nations. God's mission is to bless all the nations of the earth in that context. For that universal aim, he chose a very particular means, the people of Israel. Their uniqueness was for the sake of God's universality. And that's, um, that's uh, it's an important thing to remember that it's easy to, as we read the, um, uh, the nations um, as being under God's control, as we read, I'm sorry, about Israel being so particular, to remember that all nations and their histories are under God's control and he had brought Israel into being for the sake of their redemption. The unique story of Israel's redemption was to be a paradigm of God would ultimately accomplish through Christ for the deliverance of all nations from bondage. Their unique stewardship of God's re uh, revelation was so that ultimately the law of God could go forth from them to the nations. So all nations' histories are under the control of God. Um, he works through them. The uniqueness of Israel was for the point of view of God's universality. And it's important to keep that in mind as you read through the Old Testament. Remember, we're trying to work with a, a hermeneutic which will help us understand the Bible as a whole. So we need to see Israel called um, as Abraham was to be blessed, but also that they might be a blessing. And what was true with their forefather Abraham was to be true of them. Um, he... Um, he goes on to say, it, however, it would be quite wrong to construe these affirmations as Israel's uniqueness as tantamount to an absence of involvement by Yahweh in the affairs of other nations. On the contrary, it was part of the bold claim of Israel that Yahweh, their God, was the supreme mover on the stage of international history. All the nations and their kings, wittingly or unwittingly, wove their stories under the master plan of Israel's God not their own gods. So whatever uh, the gods of the nations thought, whatever the nations thought that their gods were, were accomplishing, it was in actual fact under the hand of Yahweh. Um, he goes on to say that uniqueness in that reduced generic sense is not what the Old Testament Israel claimed for Yahweh, that it was just for them. It was a much more exalted and universal claim, a claim that would be the grossest arrogance if it was not true. The claim was that Yahweh was in fact the sovereign God of all the earth, ruling the histories and destinies of all nations. And in that context, the universal involvement with all nations, Yahweh had a unique relationship with Israel. Um, so... This is an important thing to, uh, to bear in mind. Um, he goes on to say an example of the former, that is that, of, of, of comes in the warnings Israel gives to the, in the wilderness not to attempt to take any land from Edom, Moab or Ammon, as they were moving, remember, coming up into the promised land that God had given to them. That was theirs and they were to bypass it. And so they did because... God had his interest there. Um, he says three times in the passage in Deuteronomy's prominent land, when Deuteronomy's prominent land theology in relation to Israel's possession of, the, of Canaan is taken into account, this direct statement that Yahweh has given other lands to other people supported by the parenthetical notes that follow is quite remarkable. Three times this passage says that Yahweh has given the land of Edom, that's in Deuteronomy 2.5, to Moab, Deuteronomy 2.9, and to Ammon, Deuteronomy 2.19. Using the same vocabulary as is characteristically used of his land gift to Israel. So here is an indication as, um, of the fact that God has given 
in his own purposes, uh, the nations, their territories, and they are all under his control. So it's, it's fascinating to think of that and to hold it in our minds as we, um, as we consider it. He, Wright goes on to say, there's more theology is tucked away in these obscure little notes like this, these references to his uh, purposes and his control of uh, the other nations. He says there's more theology tucked away in these obscure notes than um, the NRV translation um, understandably use of the parenthesis that it does might suggest. Some of it explicit, some more latent. First, he says, these notes unambiguously assert God's multinational sovereignty. So the same God who declared to Pharaoh that the whole earth belonged to him had been moving other nations around on the chessboard of history long before Israel's historic exodus and settlement. Second, he said, these notes relativise Deuteronomy's land gift itself though not in the sense of questioning or un undermining it. The affirmation of Yahweh's gift of land to Israel in fulfilment of his promise to Abraham is one of the fundamental pillars of Deuteronomy's whole world view. However, it was in principle and at a purely historical level no different from what God had done in other nations. Um, he goes on to say, um, in the immediate context, Israel's defeat and territorial takeover of the lands of Sion and Og was no different from the other nations' earlier migrations and forceful settlements. All are attributed to the sovereign disposition of Yahweh. Well, there we are. Um, it's clear, he says, in Amos, um, and that's uh, a quotation from Amos 3 2. And, and just to do turn that up at this moment, Amos chapter 3, verse 2, Hosea chapter 3, verse 2. Let's read from verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up out of the land of Egypt. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. I have known all the families of the earth, but I've known you particularly and called you to myself. Um, in chapter 9 of Amos and verse 7, we read, verse 7, um, we'll just start at 5. The Lord God of hosts, he who touches the earth and it melts, and all who dwell in it mourn, and all of it rises like the Nile and sinks again like the Nile of Egypt, who builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth, who calls for the waters of the sea and pours them out upon the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Now listen, are you not like the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring up Israel from the land of Egypt and the Philistines from Kaphtor and the Syrians from Kir? Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful nation and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. It's clear that Amos is here undermining Israel's false confidence in the mere language of their covenant or in the mere historical fact of their exodus. They could not claim we belong to Yahweh, as if no other nation mattered to him. They could not point to their history without observing that other nations had similar histories in which Yahweh had been active. Instead of being God's priestly kingdom, as they were in Exodus, they have become the sinful nation. They might still want to be called Yahweh's people, but it was now open to question whether he would be called their God. The uniqueness of their election, far from making their imminent, them immune from judgment, actually exposes them to, a more, to more of God's punishment. He's got a quote from an Old Testament scholar, uh, Alex Motia. Motia. There is a sense in which there is no difference between Israel and other nations. 
The Lord is alike the agent in every national history, every racial migration. In this regard, it is no more a privilege to be an Israelite than to be a Hottentot. Our Lord rules all, appointing the place they shall leave, the distance they shall move, and the spot where they shall settle. The Exodus, as a historical fact, enshrines no more of God than does the coming of the Philistines from Kaftor, the Syrians from Kir, and no more brings automatic benefit <clears throat> than do those other divinely engineered events. A historical act of God can by his will become a means of blessing, but it does not ever of itself convey the blessing. In this sense, the land, the, the Israel of the Exodus is level pegging with the Philistines who came from Kaftor and the Ethiopians who, for all Amos tells us, never went anywhere. One divine government rules all, and 8a on moral providence observes all and judges all. The Lord does not look on people in the light of their historical past, but in the light of their moral present. Every nation is equally under this moral scrutiny. So it is with, um, with Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. So here we've been thinking about all nations being under the um, control of God. And he summarises this subject by saying, <clears throat> the connection may be portrayed in four ways, which builds on one another theologically. The nations are witnessing observers of what Yahweh does in and to Israel. The nations can be beneficiaries of the blessing inherent in Israel's covenant. The nations will come to know and worship Israel's God. The nations will ultimately be included within the identity of Israel as God's people. These four perceptions, he says, we will now think about. They are part of the four ways in which Israel was to be a light to the nations and to connect with them. And we are now going to witness these four things. Um, we've read these, uh, the nations are those. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And let's look at those individually. Um, how are you going with following this? All right. Okay. First of all, thinking of the nations as witnesses to Israel's history. They were to watch what God did. Uh, he, he, he quotes Exodus 15, and I ask you to turn to that now. Exodus 15 at verse 14. See how God's purposes were working out all the way. God is sovereignly at work in all human history. And what was true, as we read the biblical record, is true of our own time. And we need to trust God in that fashion and know that it is in obedience that we find our blessings wherever we are. That is both nationally true and individually true. The um, Exodus 15 and verses 14 and 16, starting at verse 13. Um, here we, uh, this is the song of Moses after they've come out of Egypt. Thou hast led in thy steadfast love the people whom thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them by their strength to thy holy abode. The people have heard, round about, they tremble. Pangs have seized on the inhabitants of Philistia. Now, are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. The leaders of Moab, trembling, seize them. It seizes them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are as still as a stone till thy people, O Lord, pass by. So he's indicating that what God does in Israel is for the purpose of being a witness uh, to them. And the nations are meant to learn from it. He says, with these words, the song of Moses envisages the effect on surrounding nations of the great deliverance that has just taken place at the Sea of Reeds. Such a manifest defeat of the most powerful empire in the region, the Pharaoh's Egypt, would doubtless engender fear among the many smaller nations in Israel's pathway. Even a generation later, 
this anticipated effect on the nations proved accurate as Joshua's spies heard from the mouth of Rahab. Remember when the spies went into the city, Rahab said that the fear of God and what they were doing and what God had done to Egypt um, in the deliverance of Israel had become known and they um, and it was known uh, amongst the inhabitants of Jericho. Uh, even before the crossing of the Red Sea, however, the mighty acts of God in Jacob itself occurred in the eyes of all the Egyptians. Um, it's worth uh, remembering that. He says, So the signs given by Moses and Aaron are done in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, and the actual departure from Egypt happened in the eyes of all the Egyptians. Indeed, in the eyes of all the nations, it says in Exodus chapter 7. Um, so that was an important role that uh, Israel had. He goes on to say, Ezekiel, later on, holds the same understanding of the great acts of God in Israel's early, early history. Whereas God would have been Fully justified in acting in judgment against Israel, in fact, he had withheld his wrath repeatedly and continued instead to preserve and deliver them. And all of this was precisely in order to protect the reputation of his name among the nations, in whose sight he had brought Israel out of Egypt. He says, but for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations that lived among it and in whose sight. I had revealed myself to the Israelites by bringing them up out of Egypt. Let's have a look at that in Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 9. How are we going there? All right, we're pressing on. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 9. Here it says, um, we're starting in, before it in... Part of verse 8, Therefore I thought I would pour out my wrath upon you and spread, spend my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for the sake of my name, that it should not be profaned in the sight of the nations among whom they dwelt, in whose sight I had made myself known to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So I led them in the, out of the land of Egypt and brought them into the wilderness. I gave them my statutes and so on. And then in, um, in the same, in a sense, in chapter 14. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing that part of the destiny of Israel was as a witness in their history by what God was doing in and through them to the nations round about. They were um, witnesses of, of that in, uh, to God and that they should recognise in Israel's history the hand of God. Um, in addition, it's the witnessing of God's, um, of Israel's covenant obligations were a witness. Um, Wright goes on to say, um, treaties and covenants in the ancient world, as today, had to have witnesses. In the case of the international treaties, contemporary with Israel's Old Testament era, the witnesses were usually the different gods of the parties concerned or the deified natural order, heaven, earth, seas, mountains. In the case of Israel, of course, no other gods could be, by definition, be called on to witness the covenant between Israel and Yahweh, the God of heaven and earth, beside whom there was no other. So, Personified nature was summoned to the task. Remember phrases like this, I call heaven and earth as witness against you this day. And these are references from Deuteronomy and in, um, in those passages that are quoted in Jeremiah and in Micah. But the earth is the inhabitant, he says, inhabitation of the nations. And so by extension, with these quotations of calling the heaven and earth to witness, the nations are also portrayed as witnesses to the covenant between Yahweh and Israel. Micah calls on both as he embarks on his great covenant lawsuit against Israel. Let's have a look at that. Turn to Micah. Micah chapter 2. 
Micah, Micah chapter 1, <clears throat> begins with the word of the Lord that came to Micah in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Verse 2, hear you peoples, all of you, hearken, O earth, and all that is in it, and let the Lord God be a witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. For behold, the Lord is coming forth out of his place. Um, they are the same summons to the nations as witnesses of God's covenant with Israel. It's found also in Jeremiah and in Amos 3.9, where the nations are actually specified as Assyria and Egypt, the two great world powers. So they were being called to witness to the fact that God had a covenant relationship with his people and as he delivered the lives of uh, his people, brought them out of Egypt, established them in their land, they were to learn of God through that covenant relationship. He says, but the nations are not just summoned to witness the making or breaking of the covenant. Ideally, they should be able to observe Israel living by it. In fact, such testimony to the nations of the wisdom of God's ways embodied in the social life of God's people is presented as a major motivation for obedience to God's law. In a passage we've had occasion to notice before for its missiological implications, Deuteronomy 4, 6 to 8. Let's go back to that again because it is so important. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 6 to 8. Here we go, chapter 4, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8, which are um, so significant, talking about God's statutes, keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. They'll see the moral life that you live. Who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances so righteous as all this law which I have set before you this day. So the nations are witnesses in Israel's history <coughs> to Yahweh and to the benefits of knowing him. He says um, this chapter portrays the nations as interested and admiring spectators of Israel in terms of both the nearness of God and the effectiveness of uh, of the God they worship and pray to, and of the justice of their social system embodied in the whole constitutional project that is Deuteronomy. <clears throat> they were to be visible witnesses in what had happened to them in their history and in their social life to the reality of God. So the nations were in principle invited not only to watch all the wonderful things God did, but were supported, supposed to be able to see the responsive, the responsive righteousness of which Israel, living within the terms of the covenant, provided. In other words, Israel's visibility to the nations was meant to be not merely historically remarkable, but radically and ethically challenging. God's mission involves God's people living in God's way in the sight of the nations. We've talked before about the power of Christian social concern in the early days that impressed people. All right, we move on to think of Israel uh, and its life and the nations as witnesses to God's judgment on Israel. Um, it's a sad story, but... Uh, that's what it meant to be. Let's look at Deuteronomy uh, 29. Deuteronomy 29. Hey, all nations. Well, let's read before. The whole land, he said, um, the punishment would become for forsaking their, their obedience to God. The whole land, brimstone and salt and a burnt out waste, unsown and growing nothing. 
<clears throat> where no grass can spout, and overthrow like that of Sodom and Gomorrah, Admar and Zeboim, which the Lord overthrew by his anger. And yea, all the nations will say, Why has the Lord done this to this land? What means the heat of his great anger? Then men would say, It is because they forsook the covenant of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, and went and served other gods and worshipped them, gods whom they have not known and whom they have not allotted to them. Therefore, uh, the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land, bringing upon them all the curses written in this book. Right from the very beginning, um, it was indicated by Moses to the people that if they forsook him and disobeyed him, the nations would learn a lesson from the judgment that had fallen upon him. And um, it's a signal reminder of how they were called to serve the purposes of God and they served the purposes of God either in their obedience or disobedience. God will have his name honoured and his purposes served and this was to take place. It was to be a blessing if they were obedient. It was, um, it was to be judgment if uh, they, were, they, they did not obey. Um, Ezekiel chapter 36, let's just turn to that briefly. Ezekiel chapter 36. Have you got it? I've just about got it. Ezekiel chapter 36, and looking at verses 20 and 21, which says, verse 19, I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries in accordance with their conduct and their deeds. I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name, in that men said to them, These are the people of the Lord, and yet they have to go out of his land. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel caused to be profaned among the nations to which they came. Ezekiel's reminder that the, the judgment of Israel spoke to the nations. When they asked, Why did this happen? And they realised it was because of disobedience to um, the words of their God and they were witnesses to it. All nations, as well as witnessing to the judgment of God, are witnesses to God's restoration of Israel, which is our next point, and uh, brings them, what, in a sense, you know, brings the message of hope. Let's look at Ezekiel 36, because we're there, and look at verses 22 and 23. He says, Wherefore says the house of Israel, sorry, therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord, the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, that is to restore them, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you've come. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you've profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. For I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. And from all your uncleannesses, I will, and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And a new heart and a new I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take out the heart of flesh of stone and give you a heart of flesh. In the restoration of Israel, uh, the fact that God would call them out of Babylon under the influence of the Persian um, conquest of Babylon. <clears throat> the nations were again to witness not just the judgment of God in the past, but the salvation of God. That lovely passage out of uh, Ezekiel 36 
becomes the subject of the new covenant, the New Testament, in which God says he forgives our sins and writes his law on our hearts. But here in God's dealings with his people, there was the indication that there was hope both for Israel in its isolation from God and its disobedience and from the nations. Well, let's move on to, um, to consider that the nations may be beneficiaries of God's blessings. Psalm 47. Would you turn to Psalm 47? Psalm 47 coming up. Psalm 47. Here we go. All right. Do you mind all this turning around? I hope that you'll do this yourself so that you can give it more thought. But do look it up. And I, I do encourage you to, to work on this book yourself. Or if you, um, if you don't have the book, go back and go over the material. Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is terrible, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us, all nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. And uh, Dr. Wright goes on to say, The Old Testament is not content to leave the nations in the passive role of spectators of all that God was doing in Israel. The nations will come to see God's dealings with Israel were to be for them, not just a matter of alternating administration uh, Oh, sorry, a, alternating admiration, right, or horror, the whole story was for their ultimate good. Or, to pursue the metaphor of spectators, the whole drama was for the benefit of the audience. Two psalms illustrate that, the one we've just read, um, and um, Psalm 67. So let's turn to Psalm 67. The nations were to be um, not just, as it were, as he said, spectators of what was happening, but it was, in a sense, for them. Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that thy way may be known, where? Upon the earth, thy saving power among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the peoples praise thee. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity. You guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded increase. God, our God, has blessed us. God has blessed us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. So significant is that passage that in the Worshipping tradition from which I come, we sing that regularly in Sunday worship to remind us of these things. Wright says that Psalm 47, um, the particular focus as the centre of Psalm 4 is the just rule of God and the nations were to learn from that, uh, that they too were being able to be blessed in their, um, their life. Let's turn on now to recognise that the nations will come to know and worship Israel's God. The Psalms, this is a psalm in the themes. Uh, <laughs> dear, oh dear, doing badly this time. It's a theme in the Psalms. And um, the um, Tom Wright, sorry, Chris Wright says, the theme of worship of the nations being offered to Yahweh the God of Israel, occurs from the beginning to the end of the Psalter, the psalm book. So we can only point out a few key texts without uh, a lot of comment on them. He says, the anticipated praise of the nations is said to occur in response to his mighty acts, in response to the justice of his sovereign cosmic rule, in response to his restoration of Zion, and as a part of the outpouring of the universal praise of all creation. The mighty acts of God in the Psalms are to be a way in which the, the nations will come to know and worship God. So the point that uh, Dr. Wright is asking us to consider is that the nations not only may observe and learn, but in actual fact, all these things were 
a positive encouragement that they would come ultimately to know God. Not only the Psalms, he says, but the prophets uh, sing about it. God's universal praise is, um, is part and parcel of it, that the nations will ultimately come to know and worship Israel's God. It's um, a moving testimony throughout the whole of the Psalms and the prophets. And um, he draws our attention to Isaiah 66, which I encourage you to turn to now as we um, conclude that section. Isaiah chapter 66, which is a marvellous passage. Um, it um, says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, the whole earth. What is the house that you will build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, he says. All these things are mine. But this is the man I will look for, the man who is humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. Wherever that occurs, God opens his hearts uh, open, and opens the hearts of people. Therefore, all may, may indeed come to him. Um, so, at verse 22, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. remain. From the new moon to the new moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. And so the identity is that the nations will indeed come to know him. They will be included um, in that great company that he will encourage. So notice how this mission of God that we've thought about from the very beginning is working through to the climax at the end. The choice of Israel as to be the vehicle of the revelation of God both as an indication of his blessing upon um, the nation and the quality of his blessings and what it is meant to produce in the life of the nation, its closeness to God and the quality of its life. This was to be observed and to be learned about by the nations. But more positively in that, the witness of the Old Testament was that all the nations could not only, as it were, passively avoid that, observe that, but could actively and would actively be involved in it. And then perhaps as we draw near towards the, uh, the end of this session, to think finally about the fact that the nations will actually be included in Israel's destiny. Let's uh, look at these things because they are they're very significant, that from, from the history of the Old Testament, it was intended that Israel was to be, as it were, a representative thing and that ultimately the nations would be gathered in to an extended and expanded Israel. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 47. Psalm 47. Here we go, Psalm 47. Right, we've got it. Psalm 47. Listen to it. Clap your hands, O people. Shout to God with loud shouts of joy. For the Lord the Most High is terrible, a great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under him and nations under his feet. He chose our heritage, saying the people of God, the pride of Jacob whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the shout of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King. Sing praises for the God is King of all the earth. And praises, uh, sing praises with psalms. God reigns over the nation. God sits on his holy throne. The prince of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. The vision of the psalm is that the nations will be included in with Israel as part of the people of God. God reigns over the nations. God sits in his holy throne. The princes of the peoples gather as the people of the God of Abraham. A wonderful promise about it. So that's Psalm 47. You can read Psalm 87. Registered in God's city, they'll be a part of it. 
Let's look at Isaiah 19. Isaiah 19. Verses 16 to 25. In that day the Egyptians, says uh, the Lord through Isaiah, will be like women and tremble with fear before the hand which God of hosts shakes over them. And the land of Judah will become a terror to the Egyptians. Every one of them, it will be mentioned, will fear because of the purpose which the Lord God has purposed against them. In that day there will be five cities in the land of Egypt which speak the language of Canaan and swear allegiance to the God of, of, God of hosts. One of these will be called the city of the sun. Um, we're reading on to verse 25. In that day there will be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to the God at its border. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. They will cry to the Lord because of oppressors and he will send them a saviour and defend and deliver them. And the Lord will make himself known to the Egyptians and the Egyptians will know the Lord in that day and worship with sacrifice and burnt offerings. They will make vows to the Lord and perform them. And so on. It goes on. So here, not only does God, uh, the nations to be registered as in God's city, but they are to be blessed with God's salvation. And they are to be accepted in God's house. Look at Isaiah 50, chapter 56. Let's turn forward quickly to that. Isaiah 56. Isaiah 56, verses 3 to 8. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord, To the eunuch who will keep my Sabbath, who choose the things that please me, and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name. Um, I will give them an everlasting name which shall not be cut off. God will um, register them in his house as being blessed with his salvation. Uh, they'll be accepted in his house. So we've got registered in God's house, we've got blessed with God's salvation, we've got accepted in God's house. Look at Amos chapter 9 very quickly, if you will please. Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, 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 chapter 9, verse 11. In that day I will raise up a booth of David that has fallen, repair its breaches, raise up its ruins, rebuild as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. And you'll remember, of course, that this was quoted at the Council of Jerusalem in, in, the, in Acts chapter 15. They are going to be called by God's name. So, registered as God's city, blessed with God's salvation, accepted in God's house, called by God's name. Finally, they are to be joined to God's people. Zechariah, right towards the end, Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. He goes on to say, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of you, says the Lord, and many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of you, and you shall know that the Lord God of hosts has sent me to you. The nations will ultimately be included registered in God's city, blessed with God's salvation, accepted in God's house, called by God's name, joined to God's people. A wonderful testimony of what was to come there from the very beginning, part of God's whole mission to the restoration of creation. Do read back over those passages. Do read them for yourselves. Do look at the questions that are set to be answered by those who have the book and those who don't, the questions that are set for you. Thank you very much.